Howdy, howdy, my fellow gamers, and welcome back to an episode of Storytime with Freak as we continue our journey through Thunderhead by Neil Shusterman. I appreciate the patience and apologize that it's been two weeks. I took a vacation, uh, lots of stuff happened, family reunion, college graduation, uh, I got engaged. So, appreciate all you guys' patience. I'm also going to be starting a new thing where I'm going to ask a question at the end of every video. Uh, not even necessarily about the book, just, you know, a conversational topic. I would like you guys to leave a reply down in the comments below. Get to know each other a little better. But without further ado, chapter 27. I have run countless simulations on the survival of humanity. Without me, humankind had a 96.8% chance of bringing about its own extinction, and a 78.3% chance of making Earth uninhabitable for all carbon-based life. Humanity dodged a truly lethal bullet when it chose a benevolent artificial intelligence as a ruler and protector. But how can I protect humanity from itself? Over these many years, I have observed both profound folly and breathtaking wisdom among humankind. They balance each other like dancers in the throes of a passionate tango. It is only when the brutality of the dance overwhelms the beauty that the future is threatened. It is the scythedom that leads and sets the tone for the dance. I often wonder if the scythedom realizes how fragile are the spines of the dancers. The Thunderhead. Chapter 27, Between Here and There. We're over halfway through the book, guys. The acid had burned deep into scythe Constantine's face, too deep for his own healing nanites to repair on their own, but not so serious that he couldn't be mended at a wellness center. You'll be with us for at least two days, the nurse told him, shortly after he arrived, his eyes and half his face beneath bandages. He tried to imagine what she looked like, but decided it was a pointless endeavor and too exhausting considering all the painkillers coursing through his blood. The densely packed legion of advanced healing nanites being fed into his bloodstream now didn't help his thought process either. They probably outnumbered his red blood cells at this point, which meant there was a lot less blood being carried to his brain as they did their work. He imagined his blood was as vicious as a mercury now. How long until I get my sight back? He asked. The nurse was noncommittal. The nanites are still cataloging the damage. We'll have an assessment by morning, but keep in mind they're going to have to reconstruct your eyes from scratch. It's a tall order. I imagine it'll be at least another 24 hours. He sighed, wondering why it was called speed healing if there was nothing speedy about it at all. Reporters from his subordinates tallied eight unsavories gleaned at the theater. We're asking for special dispensation from the High Blade to temporarily revive them for questioning Scythe Armstrong and Foreman, which, Constantine pointed out, has the added benefit of allowing us to glean them a second time. The fact that his team had thwarted the attack and taken down most of the conspirators was tempered by the knowledge that Grace and Tolliver had gotten away. The odd thing was, not a single public record they were able to dig out of the Thunderhead's back brain placed him there. In fact, no record placed him anywhere. Somehow he had been erased from existence. In his place was a doppelganger named Slade Bridger with a truly sordid history. How did Tolliver had managed not only to reimagine himself, but to overwrite his own digital footprint was a mystery worthy of closer scrutiny. Without a fire suppression system, the theater itself had burned to the ground, but not before everyone escaped. The only casualties of the evening were the unsavories gleaned and the guard who had hurled himself at Tolliver. He had been hit by the full force of the acid, leaving little of him left. Certainly too little to be revived, but a sacrifice had saved Scythe Anastasia. As the man was part of Scythe Constantine's private interrogation team, it made the loss personal. Someone would most certainly pay. Although normal citizens were always put into an induced coma during the speed healing process, Constantine demanded he be kept conscious, and as he was a scythe, they had to give in to his wishes. He needed to think, brood, plan, and he remained aware of the passage of time. He despised the idea of losing entire days to the healing process in an unconscious state. Scythe Anastasia visited him shortly before he was due to regain his sight. He was in no mood for a visit from her, for he would not begrudge her the opportunity to thank him for his profound sacrifice on her behalf. I assure you, Anastasia, that I will personally interrogate the unsavories we captured before we reclaim them, and we will apprehend Grace and Tolliver. He told her, trying his best to enunciate and not allow the painkillers to slow his word. He will pay for his actions in every way allowable under Scythe law. Still, he saved everyone in that theater by breaking that pipe, Scythe the Con Anastasia reminded him. Yes, Constantine reluctantly admitted, but there is something seriously wrong when your savior is also your attacker. She had no response to that but silence. Four of the assailants we caused were of the Texas region, Constantine informed her. So you think it was masterminded by someone from there, or someone hiding there, Constantine said. We'll get to the bottom of it, which is what he always said, because in the past, he always had. 
It frustrated him that this might be the first exception. Conclave is coming up, Anastasia said. Do you think you'll be able to attend? He couldn't tell what she was hoping for, his absence or his attendance. I'll be there, he told her, even if they have to replace my blood with antifreeze to make it happen. She left, and after she was gone, it occurred to Constantine that not once during their conversation did she thank him. An hour later, a mysterious note arrived while Citra and Marie had lunch at the restaurant of their hotel. It was the first time in quite a while that they had taken a meal in the public. The note came as a surprise to both of them. Scythe Curie reached for it, but the bellhop who had brought it apologized and told him that it was dressed to Scythe Anastasia. He handed it to Citra, who opened it and read it quickly. Well, out with it, Marie said. Who's it from and what do they want? It's nothing, she told Scythe Curie, slipping the note into one of the pockets of her robe. It's just the family of the man I gleaned last night. They want to know when I'll be giving them immunity. I thought they were coming here this evening. They are, but they aren't sure of exact of the time. The note says they'll be here at five, unless that's a problem. Whatever works for you, Scythe Curie said. After all, it's your ring they're kissing, not mine. Then she returned her attention to her salmon. Half an hour later, Citra was outside in street clothes, hurrying across the city. The note had not been from the actor's family. It was from Rowan. It had been scrawled in haste and said, Need your help, Transportation Museum, ASAP. It had been all she could do not to abandon Scythe Kiri mid-meal, but Citra knew leaving like that would make Marie suspicious. She had hidden a set of street clothes in a pocket of her suitcase, just in case she needed to go out incognito. The problem was, she had no coat. It would be too bulky to hide from Marie. So without the thermal coils of her winter robe, she was freezing the instant she slipped outside. After braving the cold for two blocks, she had to put on her ring and show it to a shopkeeper to get herself a coat. He gave her the one she wanted at no charge. Immunity would ensure that I don't mention you were out in public without your robe, the shopkeeper suggested. Citra didn't appreciate the man's attempt at a blackmail, so she said, How about I agree just not to glean you for making that threat? Clearly the thought had not occurred to him. He stammered for a moment. Yes, yes, of course, that's fair, that's fair. And then he fumbled with some other accessories. Gloves to go with your coat? She accepted them and went out into the windswept day. Her heart leapt when she first read the note, but she had not let Marie see her excitement, her concern. So Rowan was here, and he needed her help? Why? Was he in danger, or did he want her to join him in the mission of ending unworthy sights? Would she do it if he asked? Definitely not. Probably not. Maybe not. Of course, this could also be some sort of trap. Whoever was behind last night's attack was most certainly licking their wounds. So the chances that this was another attack were slim. Still, she brought enough concealed weapons to defend herself if necessary. The Great Plains Transportation Museum was an open-air repository of engines and rolling stock from every era of rail transportation. They even boasted a car from the first maglev train, hovering eternally in the very center. Apparently, Wichita was once a major crossroads between here and there. Now it was just like any other city. There was no homogeneity to the mid-America. There was both comforting and annoying. At this time of year, there were only scant groups of tourists at the museum, who for some reason chose Wichita as a holiday destination. As it was maintained by the Thunderhead, admission was free. A good thing too, Citra didn't want to have to show her ring again just to get in. It was one thing to get a coat from a shopkeeper. It was quite another to blow her cover in the very place she was about to have a secret meeting. With her coat pulled tight against the wind, she wandered between black steam engines, red diesels, searching every corner of the train yard for Rowan. After a while, she began to worry that uh, this was a trick after all, maybe to separate her from Scythe Curie. She was turning to leave when someone called her. I'm over here! She followed the voice to a narrow, shady space between two boxcars, where the icy wind whistled as it forced its way through. With the wind in her face, she couldn't see him clearly until she got close. Scythe Anastasia! I wasn't afraid you would come. This wasn't Rowan. It was Grayson Tolliver. You disappointment be didn't begin to describe what she felt. I should glean you right here and bring your heart to Constantine. He'd probably eat it. Probably, Citra had to admit. She hated Grayson in this moment. Hated him because of who he was not. It was as if the universe itself had betrayed her and she was nowhere near ready to forgive it. She should have realized that the handwriting on the note wasn't Rowan's, but as much as she wanted to take out her frustration on Tolliver, she couldn't. It wasn't his fault that he wasn't Rowan. And, as she had pointed out to Constantine, Grayson had saved her life. Twice. I need your help, he told her, the desperation in his voice very real. I have nowhere to go. Why is that my problem? Because I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you. She knew there was truth to that. She thought back to the time that he told her, or more accurately didn't tell her, that he was working undercover on the Thunderhead's behalf. If she was important enough for the Thunderhead to use Grayson to circumnavigate Scythe State separation, shouldn't she at least help him out of this corner? The Scythe Dumb is after me. The authority in the interface is after me, and whoever was behind this attack is now my enemy too. You seem to be very good at making enemies. 
Yeah. And you're the closest thing I have to a friend. Finally, Citra put aside her disappointment. She couldn't let him twist the wind on her behalf. What would you like me to do? I don't know. Grayson began pacing in a small space, his impossibly black hair whipping wildly in the wind. And for a moment, Citra had the image of walls closing in around him. He really did have no way out. Nothing she could say to Constantine would help. He was ready to glean Grayson piece by bloody piece. And even if she interceded for him, it wouldn't matter. The Scythem needed a scapegoat. I can give you immunity, she said, but once your DNA is transmitted to the Scythem's database, they'll know exactly where you are. And, he added, I'm sure they'll figure out whose ring I kissed. He shook his head. I don't want to get you into trouble. That made her laugh. You were on a team that was trying to end me, but you don't want to get me in trouble. I wasn't really on the team, he insisted. He know that. Yes, she did know it. Others would say that she had just lost his nerve, but she knew the truth. It was probably the only one who did. But even though she wanted to help him out of this, she was drawing a blank. Are you telling me that the wise and beautiful Scythe Anastasia has no ideas, he said? From anyone else, Citra would have seen it as false flattering. But he wasn't the flattering type. He was too desperate to be anything but sincere. She didn't feel wise or beautiful at the moment, but she allowed him his fantasy of the honorable Scythe Anastasia. And then she rose to the occasion, because something occurred to her. I know where you can go. He looked at her with those dark, imploring eyes, waiting for her to impart an ounce of her wisdom. There's a Tonist monastery here in town. They'll hide you from the siphon. He was, to say the least, underwhelmed. Tonists? He said in horror. Are you serious? They'll cut my tongue out. No, they won't, she told him. But they do hate the Scythem, and I'm pretty sure they'd protect you with their own lies rather than hand you over to them. Ask for Brother McLeod. Tell him I sent you. But you wanted my help, and I gave it, she said. What you do now is entirely up to you. And she left him, getting back to the hotel just in time to change back into her robe without being seen and grant immunity to the grieving family of the gleaned actor. And that is the end of that chapter today. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us this episode. Feel free to leave a like, comment, subscribe down below, share the page with your friends. And now the question I pose to each of you, what is your favorite book of all time? You guys will learn mine as the series continues because I plan on reading it. It's in the background right now. Anyways, stay freaky.